It's a pleasure to introduce the invited speaker of FOSAX this year, Joel Wagnin. His one-line biography is that he's a Canadian with a uh, <laughs> with the name of Jewish Moroccan origin, who made a career in Britain, married a French, and has just moved to Germany. If I want to refine this a little bit, uh, Joel got a, uh, his degree in computer science at McGill in Montreal. He, and after a postdoc in Carnegie Mellon, he moved to Oxford, where he moved through the ranks until he made it to professor. And last year, he got a very prestigious uh, research position as research director at the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems in Saarbrücken, in Germany. So, uh, Joel is an expert in the theory of formal verification, is one of the leading figures in the area. If you have any questions concerning metric temporal logic or the theory of uh, time systems in, uh, more generally, then he is the person to ask. He worked on that for quite a few years. Then he later initiated also a very fruitful line of research on the theory of infinite states probabilistic systems. So he has made very important contributions in the area. And a few years ago, to make this short, he has started uh, again a very interesting research line on the theory of uh, linear dynamic systems. These are very general systems in which the transformation between a state to the next one is given by a linear transformation. And in particular, this is a fascinating, this is an area with fascinating connections to many open questions in other areas of mathematics like convex geometry or number theory. So in particular, the next time that a mathematician or a physicist at your institution tells you that, uh, you know, what the verifiers are doing is intellectually shallow, you should just point him to his work him or her to his work. And uh, what else? Uh, yeah, of course, he has received for this work uh, several accolades, including the Roger Needham Award, uh, which is the most important British uh, award for young uh, uh, computer scientists. And he got last year an uh, uh, ERC Consolidator Grant. And I would like to finish with uh, maybe uh, one of the, another very important contribution of Joel Wagnin to computer science. He has put a very special place on the map. That place is the wine cellar of St. John's College in Oxford. He has turned this place into a place of pilgrimage for a whole generation of computer scientists. I am, have the honor to belong to that, uh, uh, to that uh, uh, bunch of guys. So if you are a young uh, PhD student and you also want to visit this holy place, uh, sorry, it's too late. <laughs> he has moved to Germany. <laughs> you know, being, uh, having a certain age also has its privileges. Okay, so now uh, without further ado, I would like you to uh, give a round of applause to Joel and welcome him. Thanks, Javier. Hello, can, can everybody hear me? Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Javier, for this uh, uh, introduction that is uh, uh, clearly uh, 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 dithyrambic. Um, and thank you to the organizers for um, uh, inviting me here. Um, this is the um, second time that I'm in Uppsala. It's um, <clears throat> an absolutely wonderful place. It's uh, uh, you know great... Uh, uh, yeah, Great place to visit. I really enjoyed the uh, the conference banquet, and uh, for me it was a little bit special because my first conference um, at which I had a peer-reviewed paper was uh, Takas in 2002, which was exactly 15 years ago um, in Grenoble, and also had a banquet in a in a castle. And I thought, you know, at the time, oh wow, this is cool. Computer science uh, conferences, you always have uh, banquets in a castle, and I think this is only the second time we've had a banquet in a castle. But anyway, I enjoyed it uh, greatly. Um, so I will talk to you uh, today about some uh, joint work, um, some work that I've done with my uh, collaborator. Uh, a lot of the very nice things that uh, Javier uh, said about me should also apply to uh, uh, James Worrell, who's uh, my colleague in Oxford, with whom I've, I've worked for a number of years. And some of this stuff has been done with two former PhD students, um, Vancy Chonev and uh, Joan Souza Pinto. So I want to talk to you about some fundamental uh, problems in dynamical and cyber-physical uh, systems. So echoing um, Kim Larson's talk where he, there was, um, well, as he put it, um, there's nothing as uh, practical as a good theory. So there was a theory, but it was also very much the application. I think at this stage, we're definitely in the foundational side. So we're looking at um, theoretical questions and, you know, eventually um, some of these things might become uh, applicable. But at this point, this is very, uh, very foundational. Uh, this is a flavor of this talk. So <clears throat> I should first um, 
start by saying that, uh, so I wasn't, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of a recent thing for me, these uh, working in this area, especially with the continuous dynamical systems and, and, and cyber physical systems. But I remember, um, the, uh, you know, throughout my time in computer science that very often uh, computer scientists see themselves as working exclusively with uh, discrete objects. And there was a comment that uh, a fellow postdoc uh, in, in 2002 uh, at CMU said, uh, so she said, um, oh, when I, when I see a differential equation, I just leave the room. So I'm glad to see not too many people have left the room. Um, and I also was talking to a colleague uh, a few years ago, and he said, uh, I've used calculus maybe four times in, in um, uh, the last 30 years. And this is... Um, uh, uh, you know, a theoretical computer scientist. So I asked him, oh, um, I was curious, you know, where did you use calculus? And he couldn't remember any of the times he'd used this, except recently he'd used it to solve a puzzle in a newspaper, in the, you know, one of these brain teasers. So that was the only instance he could actually remember. And that counted as one of the four times, apparently. Um, and then I was talking to a CNRS uh, researcher, uh, who said, who basically was kind of dismissive of the whole area. So, ah, it's just a numerical approximation. Uh, no, it's, uh, you know, it's no, no real fundamental. Uh. So anyway, so on this um, uh, backdrop, I'll try to convince you that there are some interesting things uh, to do there. And, um, and we'll see. So first of all, I think the answer to why continuous mathematics is, um, has been very clear in the sort of the, the, the advent of cyber physical systems. I mean, this is at least for the last, 20, 25 years there has been work uh, in this area. There's a conference dedicated to uh, HSCC, which is dedicated to the study of uh, uh, cyber-physical systems. And these are systems which, uh, as, as you all know, and as we heard in Kim's talk, have a discrete component and they uh, and interact continuously with their environment. So here you have a self-driving car. Uh, this, uh, this yellow car here has got sensors and so on. It's interacting with this environment. If you're going to model such objects, you will have to take account of the continuous dynamics as well as the discrete uh, transitions, obviously. Here is uh, another example. This is something that's implemented um, that has been implemented for many years, at least 20 years. Uh, many cars have had these. This is, this is adaptive cruise control. So this car here is on cruise control. And as also either a radar or a laser uh, to detect how far the car in front is. And if it gets too close, then it will automatically start braking. And uh, you can model, obviously, the system uh, you know, using... Um, well, you know, differential equations, and uh, obviously there are different modes because you're accelerating or braking or, um, and so on. And what you want to, presumably what you want to check is that the system is safe. So in particular, you never have any collision. Um, <clears throat> so how do you model these things? Uh, so you typically would model them using a hybrid uh, uh, automaton. So here's, if you've never seen these things, don't, don't worry, uh, you know, it's just, just a... Um, just a picture there, but although it took a long time to draw. Um, but um, uh, you, you basically have the discrete states. So I apologize, the pointer is not very visible. So you've got the discrete states. Here's you've got the state P. Here's you've got the state Q. So you have discrete transitions. And within the states, you have uh, con continuous evolution. So here, X is a vector of real-valued variables. Um, and this X dot means the derivative of X uh, with respect to time. So each in this vector of variables, each variable is differentiated with respect to time, and it satisfies some differential equation or sometimes some differential inclusion, which is why I've put it in this uh, uh, F of P. But basically, think of it as differential equations inside the nodes and then discrete transitions with some guards and some invariants. So we'll come back at, various, you know, at some point. But this is the, the kind of the basic model. And uh, just to make it a little bit more concrete, so here's, here's your vector X, uh, which... Um, takes as input uh, a, a real valued variable. This is time, okay, so you exit time t, and will give you um, a, a vector of uh, real valued variable. I think my pointer is going to die, so I'll just motion with my hands. So um, you, um, you, you, you have a trajectory. Uh, this follows trajectory as time evolves in here in k space, okay? So you could write it like this. So uh, you've got x1 of t up to xk of t. Each of these are real to real. Um, and uh, in particular, if you want to model this adaptive cruise uh, control system, you would maybe perhaps x1 of t might represent the position of this car, x2 of t might represent the position of that car, and a collision would be, uh, would, uh, oh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, thanks very much, uh, um, yes, Peter and uh, Javier. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. I was impaling myself there. Oh, fantastic! Look at that. So I have to uh, see if I can coordinate the clicking. So um, 
with this, the, so uh, uh, if x1, x1 of t represents the, let's say, the position of, of this car along this, uh, on this road, and x2 is the position of that car, then the collision is x1 of t equals x2 of t, okay? And that would be the system hitting a hyperplane, the hyperplane given by x1 of t equals x2 of t. Okay, does that make sense? So this is a, these are the kind of questions that will be, um, you know, that people are typically interested in because you want to make sure you never have a collision, right, when you model these things. Subjects, of course, to maximal rates of acceleration and deceleration and so on. So um, <clears throat> now the, the kind of dynamics you can have uh, uh, is um, uh, there, there's, there's uh, multiple kind of dynamics you can have. So the, most, the simplest sort of dynamics that still qualifies as a, as a hybrid system, would hybrid automaton would be uh, uh, all your variables have der derivative one, and this corresponds to the, the notion of a timed automaton. So all your variables are, are clocks. Uh, you can reset the clocks and so on, so you can do quite sophisticated things, as we, we, we heard in Kim's talk, but that's the, you know, the most basic system is timed automata. You can have rectangular uh, hybrid automata, so the, the variables now, they're not fixed to be one, but they're fixed to be constants. But it can be different constants for different variables. And the constants may even vary by location and so on. So you can still do quite a, uh, quite a, bit of, uh, quite a number of things with these things. Then you can have linear hybrid automata, where the, um, the, the, the vector of derivatives is a linear function of the variables themselves. And this is actually quite powerful. We'll see some, some examples uh, in the talk. And this goes on and so on, right? You can have nonlinear dynamics and, and whatnot. And this has been studied, as I mentioned, for, for and uh, as we've heard before, for many years. Uh, tools have been developed. So um, Opel, of course, we heard about this on, the, on the, was it Monday. Uh, high tech checkmate. This is, I worked a little bit uh, on this when I was at Carnegie Mellon. This is from Penn. Uh, and state flow is a, a tool um, also in, in industry because it's um, a tool that uh, Simulink, uh, uh, MathWorks, sorry, um, has produced for the, uh, in order to simulate uh, and, and analyze Simulink uh, systems. Right, so there's a lot, of, um, uh, uh, a lot of development, but there is a question of uh, what are the fundamental, uh, you know, what, what are some of the fundamental algorithmic questions and challenges you, you may have. So I think one of the most seminal results is uh, that of uh, Allure and Dilt. I, Kim, I couldn't find an 89 paper, so I went for the 1990. I think this is the, um, uh, the paper in which the, the region, uh, the very famous region uh, graph techniques were uh, introduced, and that showed that reachability is decidable for timed automata. And this is very much a non-trivial uh, construction, and it's, I think it's one, the journal version of this is one of the 30 most cited papers in the whole of computer science. And so it's a um, it's very impressive uh, piece of work. And then five years later, uh, Tom Hensinger and some co-authors uh, published a paper at Stock um, uh, 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 in uh, 1995, where they asked the question, what's decidable about hybrid automata? And the answer basically is not very much. Uh, apart from the, the timed automata, if you look at the abstract, I don't know if you, whether you can see, um, effectively, they say, Let's read this paragraph here in the abstract. On the negative side, we show that several slight uh, generalization of initialized rectangular automata lead to a non-decidable reachability problem. In particular, we prove that the reachability problem is undecidable for time automata with a single stopwatch. So a stopwatch is a, is a clock that can either um, not be running, so its derivative is zero, or be running, so its derivative is one. So it can have different derivatives according to the location in which it's in. And just a single stopwatch will make the reachability problem undecidable. Okay, so it's very, very, you, you hit uh, undecidable very quickly. They, they established uh, decidability for initi so called initialized rectangular automata by reduction to, to um, timed automata. And, you know, I think this is nice, but this was not nearly as seminal as the, the Euler and Dill uh, result. So this, this is quite negative. And so this was uh, 22 years ago. So, you know, you, you might ask, you know, well, what happened in the meantime? So a few results, there were a few results. Um, there was this uh, nice work um, a few years ago by um, uh, Laferriere, Papas, and uh, Jovin on um, the, the, this class of hybrid automata they call O-minimal uh, hybrid automata. So this is a, a, um, a notion from a model theory that led to some uh, surprising and interesting decidability results. But unfortunately, this is a very narrow class because most uh, hybrid automata will not be uh, O-minimal. And I'm not going to explain what it is, but basically they had a condition on the eigenvalues that was extremely restrictive. But, they, you know, but this is a nice, uh, nice result. And then we had some work some, you know, with uh, co-authors some time back where 
we showed that uh, you could decide uh, reachability for monotonic uh, rectangular hybrid automata, uh, so this, which includes uh, stopwatch automata, as long as you place a, a, um, a time horizon. Okay? So the undecidedity of stopwatch automata uh, requires an unbounded time horizon. Uh, so you know, we were happy with this, but again, this is a restricted class of, uh, of uh, programs. And then uh, two years ago, Goran Freze, um, in, in the, this is a, a, a summer school, uh, the, the proceedings of a summer school, formal modeling and verification of cyber physical systems. And Goran, in, in uh, this book, wrote that um, the problem whether a given state is reachable is undecidable, is generally undecidable. The main subclass for which your problem is decidable are timed automata, um, and that's basically it, right? So, in the in the in the basically the 20 years or the 25 years since the, the 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 region graph technique was invented, almost nothing has happened. So, if I was giving this talk two years ago, I would, you know, at this point, I would probably uh, thank you for your attention and you know conclude and ask for any any questions. Uh, but uh, thankfully, stuff has happened in the last uh, two years, uh, or at least stuff that um, uh, you know we're we're excited about. So, I, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about that. So, <laughs> if we go back to the, uh, what a hybrid automaton is, you have these discrete transitions, and you have this continuous dynamics. And m most of the approaches, although not all the approaches, but most of the approaches has consisted in trying to curtail the uh, continuous dynamics, right? So, timed automata, you say uh, all variables, the derivative with the time is just one, and uh, rectangular automata, and so on. But as computer scientists, we want to keep the discrete. So you could look another way. You could say, well, what happens if we restrict the discrete structure and just see, uh, you know, just see what happens? And the most restrictive way uh, to restrict the discrete structure would be to get rid of it entirely and just consider a single location, right? So you just consider a single one of these with no transitions, and you're just interested in the continuous dynamics. And can you say something about that? Now, it turns out this has been much more studied, in, as it turns out, than cyber physical system, because that's actually a dynamical system, um, you know, the study of which goes back to, uh, I mean, goes, you, you, you could say Poincaré started the, you know, the study in, in the very early 1900s, but you could even go back uh, further than that. Um, but on the other hand, the kind of questions that people ask about dynamical systems are very different from the kind of questions as computer scientists that we might ask. So um, mathematicians and control theorists and engineers will be interested in you know, long-term stability or ergodic behavior of such systems, whereas we want to know, uh, you know do you reach, you know, does this happen? Is this reachable? Is this not reachable? And so on and so forth. So um, we'll see whether we can get any mileage out of uh, looking at things from this perspective. So I want to give you an example, a small example. This is um, a little um, uh, uh, toy example based on um, the, the scenario um, in the, the Hobbit where Smaug, the dragon, uh, flies out of Moria and goes to uh, burn Lake Town. Um, and uh, so you see Smaug uh, uh, there uh, sort of flying over Lake Town and just uh, you know, burning the town. And these dragons, uh, they're very big. They've got these very big wings. And so they, you know, they, they, when they fly, in fact, they fly in a kind of um, sinusoidal motion, as it were. Uh, so you have to model that if you're going to model Smaug. And the only hope for the humans in Lake Town to defeat the dragon is to actually fire a black arrow. They have these very special black arrows. These are the only arrows that can kill a dragon. And the black arrow has to hitch a very, very tiny bare patch on the dragon's uh, chest, because otherwise, uh, everywhere else, he's got these incredible scales, and he just, uh, uh, you know, the, the, he just sur survives. Uh, he's unaffected. So. Um, Let's see whether this can be done. So uh, we, oops, we model this. Uh, so this is Lake Town. And then this is Smaug sort of you know, flying in this. Uh, you know. So here, I'm depicting the motion of the, the, the bare patch, because this is what we're trying to, to hit. So it's, uh, it's sort of going in this direction. And let's put a coordinate system uh, there. And the black arrow is going to be shot by uh, Bart the Bauman from Lake Town. And of course, because it's, uh, it's being shot from a, from a crossbow, it's uh, going to follow a parabolic trajectory um, because of uh, gravity. So it's going to go something like this. And the angle of the crossbow is sort of fixed. It's a, it's a sort of massive thing, but he can sort of choose the timing. So he has to get the timing right in order that you know, he, he sort of shoots the arrow when, uh, when Smaug, Smaug is uh, just above it. So let's say the Smaug uh, you know, is at some points at distance d and is flying uh, you know, this way at the average uh, height of h. And the amplitude there is you know, some, some a. 
And so his motion is given by, his horizontal motion is constant. It's uh, uh, d of t is d minus uh, st. S is his uh, uh, speed, an absolute value. And then his height is given by h plus this uh, uh, sinus term, right? So this is the, the vertical uh, component. And then the arrow here, well, if the initial velocity, uh, horizontal velocity is u0, initial vertical velocity is this, then uh, horizontally the arrow goes x of t is just u0 times t, and then y of t will follow this uh, uh, parabola uh, because of gravity. So um, you can model this. You might be surprised that this is uh, linear because it's got trigonometric terms, it's got uh, a quadratics and so on, but this actually can be modeled as a uh, linear dynamical system. Uh, but you need a few more dimensions, and then you, you project, and then you, you, you can do it. So I've, I've done it, and again, obviously, uh, the, you know, I'm, it's probably wrong anyway. Um, it's probably embarrassing. If people put on, on, you know, you guys can't see it, it's wrong. But if somebody actually, you know, stops the, 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 the YouTube video, they can actually check. But basically, what, what I've tried to do here is uh, f and g, uh, the derivative of f is uh, g, the derivative of g is minus f, so this gives you a sign. And then, um, you know, the, this is, for instance, the gravity, uh, the derivative of uh, acceleration is zero. Um, and so, you know, the derivative of the speed is, is uh, the acceleration, the derivative of position is, um, is the speed. And this is how you can model this. As a, so the vector of derivatives is some matrix times the vector of uh, uh, functions. And, the, f and the, the ones that we're interested in are d and h for the dragon and x and y for Bart. Okay? Right. And you need to also give uh, initial, it's an initial value problem, so you need to give what the initial values are. So at time zero, um, the dragon is at d and h, uh, h, and the arrow is at zero, zero. Gravity is minus uh, 9.8, and so on and so forth. And so, can BART succeed? Well, you need to solve the system. So you have, um, this is the position of uh, the, the bare patch of Smaug, and this is the position of the arrow. And the x coordinate has have to agree, and the y coordinates have to agree. So uh, you need a t such that um, x of t equals uh, d of t and y of t equals h of t. So if you solve in the first uh, equation, you have a t that depends on d. So this is, uh, BART is going to fire his arrow at a particular time. And at that time when he does, um, Smaug is at distance d from, from Lake Town, horizontally. And therefore, Bard can kill Smaug if and only if there exists a t such that when you plug it all in, v0 times t minus 4.9 t squared is equal to h plus a sin t. And so suppose I give you u0, v0, h, a, and so on. The question is, can you solve this equation? And it looks like a quadratic, but it's got a sine t there. And so it's, um, it's not something you learn how to do in school, certainly. Uh, it's not even obvious that it, this can be, you know, this is, you know, is it even decidable if there's such a t, right? I mean, I'm asking, is there a real number t such that this, this holds? And you might think, well, this is nonsense, right? I mean, uh, surely uh, it is. But the tricky case is if actually the dragon flies high enough that we assume that the initial velocity of the crossbow is, is fixed, and so... Uh, the maximum range and, the, and the, the angles are fixed. So suppose that you have this situation where it may or may not, the trajectory may or may not be tangential there. Uh, if they don't touch, I guess with enough numerical approximation, you could see that. And if they were to cross over sort of cleanly, you would see this as well. But if they're just tangent, how do you actually detect this? How do you actually, you know, can you prove this? I mean, if you, you can numerically approximate, you know, more and more and more, as my French colleague, uh, you know, might want to do, but you'll never really know whether you're really touching or whether, you, you know, you're, if, if you're actually tangential. Okay? So this is one of the issues you're going to be facing. Right. So let's look more generally. How do you, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the problem of reachability for linear dynamical systems. So again, we have this uh, vector variables x and subject to this dynamic uh, x dot is equal to ax. And we know for, I mean, this is something that's uh, well known, that you can solve these things explicitly. Uh, you write x of t is this matrix exponential. So the exponential of, uh, so that's e to the at times the vector of uh, uh, x0, which is the, the position at uh, time x0. So just to, to look at it concretely, suppose that k is 3, so you're in three dimension. At x0, you're here. You solve this equation, and that describes a trajectory through time. Through, sorry, a trajectory through space that evolves with time. Okay, does that make sense? Now, suppose you have a hyperplane. This could be the hyperplane x1 equals x2. 
uh, that corresponded to the cars uh, crashing into each other in the adaptive cruise control, or it could be the hyperplane corresponding to the arrow meeting the uh, you know, Smaug's uh, flight and so on. So suppose you've got a hyperplane like this, and you want to know whether this trajectory hits the hyperplane. So if we look here, then it seems pretty clear that the trajectory is sort of moving away from the, the hyperplane, so that's, you know, that seems pretty okay. And alternately, if the uh, trajectory looks something like this, then it looks, well, it looks pretty clear because it's crossing here, and then you can see it's on the other side at that point, so it's okay. But a really tricky part, again, is this kind of situation where you barely just sort of graze it in a sort of passive-aggressive fashion, but we never really cleanly go through it or cleanly, you know, stay away from it. And so those cases are difficult to, to handle, right? So in order to uh, make this more precise, let's say that u is the normal to this uh, hyperplane. And I'm going to write f of t, which is going to be the distance that I am at any point from the hyperplane. So f of t is simply the dot product of uh, the u transpose times the, my position vector x of t at time t. Okay? So at any time t, f of t tells me how far am I from the hyperplane. And now the question becomes, is there a value of t such that f of t is equal to 0? Okay, does f have a 0? That, that, because that corresponds to being 0 distance away from hyperplane means you've actually hit it. And you can show by the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, uh, uh, um, amongst others, you can show that f now satisfies a linear differential equation with constant coefficients. So something, you know, you, you, some, some, some basically linear combination of the terms f of t, f prime of t, dot, 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 up to fk of t uh, equals 0. And you can also show uh, from this equation here that in general f of t can be written as an exponential polynomial. So these pj of t are polynomials. And this e to the lambda jt, the lambda j's here are the eigenvalues of my matrix A. So this is all, I mean, maybe you, you know, don't remember this from, uh, from, from, from university or, or wherever, but this is sort of uh, you know, well-known well things. And um, you know, one should note that the eigenvalues are going to be complex in general, so they lead to oscillatory uh, behavior. And something quite remarkable is that, in general, this problem of hyperplane reachability for linear dynamical systems is, 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 is totally equi uh, equivalent to the existence of zeros for linear ODEs, or ordinary differential equations, with uh, constant coefficients. So, uh, because you can take, if you take any linear differ, di differential equation with constant coefficients, you can always translate the question of whether this has a zero, this, the solution to this uh, equation has a zero, to whether some linear dynamical system actually hits a hyperplane. You can go the other way. I haven't shown going the other way, but it can be done. So it's equivalent. And so in some sense, now, you know, we're talking about linear dynamical systems that have been studied for 100 years. Well, ODEs have been studied for like, 350 years or something, right? I mean, Newton was writing ODEs in, um, in, when he was writing uh, Principia. So now, all of a sudden, we're, we're, we're looking at things that have been studied for a long time. Uh, so in particular, surely it's known whether if I give you a linear differential equation, let's say everything is, you know, all the coefficients are rational. I give you a linear differential equation with constant coefficients, they're all rational. Surely it's known whether that thing has a zero or not, right? I mean, I, you know, I mean, it's, or at least so I thought. Um, Surely it's not whether it's decidable, whether it has zero or not. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. And here the dimension k is the order of the differential equation. So this is a kth order differential equation, and the dimension and the order are going to be the same. OK, so let's just look at this in a little bit more detail. So let f be uh, a function. Now, f is a function from the reals to the reals. That's the distance you are from the hyperplane. But that's also a function that's the solution to a differential equation. And let's suppose that all the coefficients are algebraic, or if you want, let all the coefficients be rational numbers. And you can define two problems. The first one is the bounded zero problem. So you're given f, and you're given a finite rational interval. And you say, is there a zero in that interval? Is there a t in that interval such that f of t is equal to 0? So this would be the, the Smaug problem, the dragon problem. Because if I'm going to hit this dragon, I'm going to do it in a bounded interval. Okay? And then you can also define the more general 0 problem. And you've got an f, and you, time can go to infinity. And you say, does f have a 0? And this might be something uh, that might suit better the cruise control uh, thing, because you could be driving for an indefinite period of time, and you just want to make sure you never actually have a 0, because that corresponds to a crash. OK, does that make sense? So these are two very, very basic problems. And when I looked at these things, I thought, OK, well, you know, surely these things are, are known, whether they're decidable or not. 
And the answer is, the decidability is open. I mean, this is, um, I don't know, this is staggering to me that uh, these things are open. Um, but they are open. And uh, despite there having been a lot of work on the, uh, figuring uh, out what the zeros of these exponential polynomials which are the explicit solution to these differential equations uh, are, uh, you know, over the last, I would say, 100 years. Um, but most of the work has been on the distribution of complex zeros. And most of the work has not been on, you know, does there exist a real zero and so on. They've been more, like I said, you know, questions about asymptotic distribution of zeros when, you know, things vary and so on. Um, and in fact, as uh, Angus McIntyre remarked in a paper two years ago, there's a great paucity of modern foundational material on computable algebra and algebraic geometry. So there's a, a lot of work, but the kind of questions mathematicians have been asking are not the kind of questions that you know, we as computer science uh, scientists might be asking. So let me just a uh, very brief state of the art. Um, so there's this paper by uh, um, uh, people from uh, uh, Vincent Blondel's group um, who, who showed uh, that in dimension two, uh, the, the bounded zero and the zero problem are decidable. And that's basically all that uh, was known at the time. Um, now, uh, we extended this last year to dimension three. So that's a little bit, that's sort of modest. But we, um, what I think was much more significant is that assuming Chaniel's conjecture, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second, but this is a conjecture number theory. Assuming Chaniel's conjecture, the bounded zero problem becomes decidable in all dimensions. Okay, so this is more exciting. So you can, you can go ahead and you know, use the algorithm that you know, we provide. And as one referee put it, this is, well, it's a win-win situation. Because if at some point your algorithm turns out to be incorrect, then you've found the counterexample of Chaniel's conjecture. And so that's also very good, right? So um, that the was, was basically a win-win win -win situation. And in dimension 9 and above, the decidability of the zero problem would entail um, major breakthroughs in analytic number theory. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this. And I forgot to put on this slide, actually, that's, that's uh, uh, funny. I forgot to put that up to dimension 8, I'll mention this later, the, the zero problem reduces to the bounded zero problem. So the, the unbounded problem, you can do it up to dimension 8, if you believe Chaniel's conjecture. And at dimension 9, um, some very, very hard mathematical obstacles come up in your way. So I'll just try to explain a little bit about these things in the, in the remaining of the talk. So let me first tell you about Chaniel's conjecture. Uh, it was formulated in the early 1960s, and it's, um, it says this. And this is more or less um, incomprehensible unless you, you work on these things. But thankfully, there is a, an equivalent version which is much easier to understand. So let's just actually look at that. And it says that... Um, you're going to take n complex numbers, okay, that are linear, linearly independent over the rationals, and now you're going to look at the set of your n complex numbers, alpha 1 to alpha n, and also the exponentials of these numbers, e to the alpha 1, e to the alpha n. And now, Chaniel's conjecture says you can find n numbers amongst this set. So I'm going to call them beta 1 to beta n. So the beta 1 to beta n range over this set that are algebraically independent over the rationals. Okay, so by algebraically independent, I mean that they don't satisfy any polynomial, uh, uh, um, algebraic or polynomial uh, relation. So more precisely, if you take any polynomial in n variable p of x1, xn that has rational or algebraic coefficients, if this polynomial evaluated at beta 1 to beta n is 0, p has to be the 0 polynomial. Okay, there's no non-trivial um, uh, algebraic relation that these numbers can satisfy. It's a conjecture. Now, it turns out that the, if the alpha 1 to alpha n are actually algebraic numbers, then this is the lindenmann weierstrass uh, theorem. So Chaniel's conjecture generalizes the lindenmann weierstrass theorem and also some other well-known theorems uh, in, uh, in number theory. But Chaniel's conjecture itself is a, is a conjecture, uh, hence the name. Um, OK, let me just show you an example. What, you know, how is this powerful? How do you use this and so on? Just, just for, for fun. Uh, anyway, this is kind of neat. I like this example. So we know that E is transcendental. This was uh, shown by Hermit, uh, Hermit in, uh, uh, quite some time ago. And pi was uh, shown to be transcendental, I guess, um, nine years after by Lindemann. It's a special case of the lindemann weierstrass theorem. And what about E plus pi, say? Or what about E times pi? 
And um, so you, when you ask people these questions, they say, well, surely people know, right? I don't know, but you know, surely people know. Actually, absolutely nobody knows. And not just this, when you talk to number theorists about this, they say, oh, if you can show E plus pi is uh, even irrational, that's a Fields Medal. That's an instant Fields Medal. This is like, you know, this, is, this would be an absolutely major accomplishment. The same with E times pi. I mean, this is what they tell you, right? I don't know whether, you know, they deliver, but this is what they tell you. But I can tell you, I can show you that one of those two has to be Irrational. In fact, one of those two has to be transcendental. Okay, I don't know which one, but I can show you they cannot both be rational or even algebraic. And here's how you do this. You consider the polynomial p of x, which is x minus c times x minus pi. So if I, if I, if I multiply it out, it's x squared minus e plus pi x plus e pi, right? And this polynomial p of x has as roots e and pi, okay, by construction. And so therefore, if e plus pi and e pi were both rational, it would mean that e and pi are roots of a polynomial with rational coefficients, and therefore algebraic numbers, but that would contradict these results um, above. Okay? So one of those two has to be irrational. In fact, you can show uh, that uh, one of those two has to be... The, the, the same proof basically will work also for, for algebraic. So you can show that one of e plus pi and one of e times pi has to be transcendental, but I don't know which one. Okay, so that's a little bit uh, unsatisfying. How does... Uh, what would Chanuel's conjecture do for you? What about, so e plus pi times pi? What about this quantity? You know, is that... Uh, so that's, that's worth two fields metal, surely. I mean, you know, look at that monster. Um, well, Chanuel's conjecture can, you know, blow all these things out of the water. So how does this work? So you apply Chanuel's conjecture with alpha equals 1, and alpha 1 equals 1, and alpha 2 equals i pi. Okay, so I, I have 1 and i pi, and then I look at the exponentials. So e to the 1 and e to the i pi. Well, that's just 1, i pi, e, and minus 1. And Chanuel says, amongst these four numbers, I must be able to find two that are algebraically independent. Well, 1 and minus 1 are algebraic themselves. I mean, they're even rational, so they certainly cannot... Um, you know, uh, they won't work. So therefore, if we assume Chanuel's conjecture, it has to be i pi and it has to be e that are algebraically independent. And because i is itself an algebraic number, it's a square root of minus one, right? Um, pi itself must be algebraic independent from e. It's not very hard to show. And therefore, e and pi are algebraically independent. So what does that mean? That means that for any non-zero polynomial p of x, y with rational or algebraic coefficients, p of e pi cannot be uh, zero, okay? So that means that these numbers there cannot be uh, rational or cannot, for that matter, be algebraic, because otherwise I'd be able to manufacture a polynomial uh, that would involve these numbers. If they were algebraic, the polynomial would be allowed to use them as coefficients, you know, as a, the constant term, and therefore I would have a p of e comma pi that would be uh, zero. Okay, so that tells you that this is transcendental, this is transcendental, this is transcendental. Basically, um, Chanuel's conjecture tells you that the only algebraic relations that can, relationships that can hold between e and pi are the completely trivial ones. The ones like e plus pi squared is e squared plus 2 e plus pi plus pi squared. That's, that's true. But anything else that's not obvious by obviousness is just not going to hold. That's what Chanuel tells you. Okay? Okay, now what the hell does this have to do with um, dynamical systems? So we have this result, and I'll try to explain. Uh, so if we assume Chanuel's conjecture, this bounded zero problem, this reachability and bounded time of a, of a hyperplane uh, is decidable, becomes decidable. Okay, so how does this work? Well, take a real valued exponential polynomial of this form. So if you remember, this is the solution. This is, uh, this is how you represent the distance to the hyperplane. And you, you can find these things explicitly. There are algorithms to find all these things ex explicitly. This is straightforward from linear algebra. So I've got f of t, which is a, a so-called exponential polynomial. So it's a sum of polynomials times these exponential terms. And the lambda j's here are algebraic numbers. They're the eigenvalues of my matrix. And so basically, I've got f of t here, I've got t, I've got a and b, and I'm asking, does this function have a zero in between a and b? That's the bounded zero problem. Okay. Well, if it has a zero at, say, t star, like this, that sort of cuts cleanly through, I can detect this because I do the numerical approximation, huh? and uh, a little bit above, a little bit below, and by the intermediate value theorem, indeed, uh, I find that um, I have um, 
I have a zero. And if I'm cleanly away from uh, the interval, because the interval AB is a compact uh, uh, set, I can build by, again, the numerical approximation, a sausage around this, uh, this thing that stays away from the, uh, the x-axis, and therefore I know that my function cannot have a zero. Okay? So I wouldn't know how to do this, I must confess, but I trust that numerical anal analysts you know, can do this. However, the tricky case is when I have something like this, right? I may have a zero. Um, I'm just going to start pressing it. I think I'm completely running out of battery on this thing. Uh, the tricky thing is when um, I have a sort of grazing zero of that nature. Okay? So here, let's say there is a zero, but it's just grazing. And you might ask, you know, can this really arise? I mean, come on. And well, it can, because for instance, if you write f of t equals 2 plus e to the i t plus e to the minus i t, so this is of this form, then for t equals pi, you will have 2 plus minus 1 plus minus 1, so you'll have 0. And for t other than an odd multiple of pi, you will be strictly above 0. So this can definitely happen. In fact, this can happen even more obviously. If you take anything that crosses and you square it, you're still going to be of that form. But now once you've squared it, you, all your zeros, your previous zeros, are now all tangential zeros, right? So, so this can definitely happen. And you, and you definitely need to be able to detect this if you, well, if you want to decide this problem. So, um, <coughs> okay. Now, the observation is, if you have a tangential zero, then f of t star is zero and f prime of t star is zero. And now, let's assume that I don't have an exponential polynomial. Let's just pretend this is just a polynomial, just to give an idea of what I would want to do if this were a polynomial. So if this were just a polynomial and I had a grazing zero like this, what could I do with this? Well, I could take the GCD of f and f prime, because they share a zero. Because the term t minus uh, t star is going to divide the GCD, because it divides both of these things. And if I take the GCD with the Euclidean algorithm, then I get a polynomial with uh, rational coefficients. And so therefore, f cannot be irreducible. Okay? If, if you have a tangential zero, you share a zero with your derivative, you take the GCD, and this shows that f has to be reducible. You can divide by the GCD. Okay? So one thing I could do if these were polynomials, I would say, OK, well, write f as a product of irreducible polynomials. Let's say f1, f2, f3, where f1 is irreducible, f2 is irreducible, f3 is irreducible. Now, by the same argument, f1, f2, and f3, those guys cannot have tangential zeros. Because we just said, if you have a tangential zero, you have to be reducible. But I'm just saying these guys are irreducible. Now, the zeros of f are exactly the zeros of those guys. Right? So I can just go check out what the zeros of f1 are, of f2 and f3. And if there are any zeros, then f is a zero. And if not, not. But I won't have, any, I won't have to deal with this tangential situation here. OK? So this is what I can do. Unfortunately, I have an exponential polynomial. So this little trick is not really going to work. But there is a notion of factoring, except you have to move to a, a slightly more funky uh, ring than the, just the, the, the ring of integers. And you factor in this sort of ring of Laurent polynomials. And OK, so this can be done. Uh, and basically, what happens is that you have a notion of irreducibility. And if, you're no, if your function f is irreducible, and f of t star is 0, and f prime of t star is 0, so this means you've got a tangential 0, then that places too many algebraic constraints on this set. This is a set t star, e to the lambda 1 t star, all the way up to e to the lambda m t star. If f, f of t star is 0, it's giving you, it's saying that some combination of these things equals 0. So some algebraic combination of these guys is 0. The same for f prime of, of t star. But because f is irreducible, f prime is going to have different zeros from f. So it's a different sort of, it's placing a different constraints. And these are too many constraints, because if you think about it, Shanuel tells me I need to be able to find m guys that are algebraically independent. But I have m plus 1 here. I've got one degree of freedom. But if I've got two constraints, then that's one constraint too many. And so it violates Chanuel's conjecture. OK, so there's lots of details. But this is the sort of the crux of the, the idea, how we, we invoke this. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about the unbounded case, because um, it's also, also interesting in, in a different way. So this is, do you have a 0? But now I'm not bounding the, the interval. I'm asking, do you have a 0 um, anywhere on the real line? And so. In order to talk about this, let me just say a few words about Diophantine approximation. So in Diophantine approximation, 
you're asking how well you can approximate, you've got a real number alpha, and you want to know how well can you approximate alpha with rationals. So how small can this be? Okay, well, the rationals are dense in the real, so clearly this can be as small as, as, as you want. But you want to make this small by using p and q that are not too small themselves. Okay, that are not, sorry, uh, p and q that are not too large themselves. You want a good approximation using numbers that are, you know, relatively small. That's the game. And Derek Clay uh, proved a long time ago that there are infinitely many integers p and q, such that alpha minus p over q is less than 1 over q squared. Okay, so you can get this kind of level of approximation um, infinitely often. And Roth showed uh, in 1955 that if alpha is an algebraic number, then for any epsilon greater than zero, if you try to improve this Dirichlet result by making the exponent here, instead of being 1 over q squared, you make it more constrained by making it q the 2 plus epsilon, then there are only finitely many solutions. Okay? And this was the culmination of a long line of work. This earned Roth the, the Fields Medal in, uh, in 58. And three years later, he was finally made a full professor at uh, UCL. Um, but um, he, uh, 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 so this was, th th this was sort of a celebrated result. Th this is a non-constructive proof, and there's still it's a, 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 there's a lot of active work on this. And this leads naturally to this, um, the definition of this constant. So we know that the exponent has to be, it's between two, well, it's two, basically. But what about the constant one? And so the Diophantine approximation type of a real number alpha, so this looks complicated, but it's very simple. You look at this equation, alpha minus p over q is less than c over q squared. And you say you want to have some p and q that satisfy this, OK? And then you want to make c as small as you can while satisfying this. And so the nth of the set of c's such that you have some solution to this is going to be the Diophantine approximation uh, type of alpha. So it's always bounded above by 1, by Dirichlet's theorem, but it could be 0. In fact, um, it's, uh, it's known to be 0. It's closely related to the continued fraction expansion of alpha. Almost all reals have uh, their Diophantine approximation type to be 0. This was known by Kitchen already a long time ago. Uh, Euler and Lagrange knew that for real algebraic numbers of degree 2, uh, the, the Diophantine approximation type is not zero, and transcendental numbers have, uh, are bounded above by one-third, not one, but one-third. But it is a major open problem whether there is even a single real algebraic number alpha of degree three or more whose Diophantine approximation type is zero. In particular, there's no known technique for proving any lower bound on the Diophantine approximation type of real algebraic numbers of degree three and above. And what our uh, what we showed is that um, if you had, so it's a hardness result, you should see it as a hardness result. If, it's, not, you know, it's not like it's undecidable or the complexity, but it's a mathematical hardness result. If you could decide the zero problem in dimension nine, okay, if you had, a, if you had an algorithm to do this, then you would have an algorithm that given any real algebraic number alpha computes the Diophantine approximation type of alpha to within arbitrary precision. So in particular, you could place lower bounds. If it's not zero, you could get within epsilon of it, and you could place lower bounds. So I'm not saying that we, we can do this, of course. I'm just saying, if you're going to solve this problem, you're going to have to solve a problem that's been open, a uh, mathematical problem that's been open for a long time. So this is a hard, you should view this as a hardness result. Um, now, the result that I forgot to mention on that previous slide is that uh, in, so that's in dimension 9, the hardness. But in dimension 8 or less, 0 reduces to bound to 0. And the idea is that in the limit, in, in dimension 8 or less, either f is never 0 or it's infinitely often 0. And we can decide which is the case, right? So after a while, we know whether it's infinitely often 0 or if it's never 0. And we can place a bound. And basically, in this way, you can reduce the 0 problem to the bound to 0 problem. Okay? So, up to, so if you believe Shan Yuol, then you believe you can solve this up to dimension 8. And the techniques that are used are uh, techniques from real algebraic geometry, and especially Diophantine approximation, in particular uh, Baker's theorem on linear forms and logarithms of algebraic number, which is uh, uh, the, 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 the result that earned Baker the Fields Medal in um, 1970. So there's, a, there's some uh, uh, Diophantine techniques that are also used to, to, to prove this reduction. So let me just um, say now a few, a few words about cyber-physical systems, because I've spoken about uh, dynamical systems, uh, y y you know, this whole talk has been about dynamical systems. But these techniques can also apply to, to uh, cyber physical systems. But you've got to change the goalposts a little bit. So, for instance, suppose you're interested in liveness for hybrid automata. 
So liveness means you're never stuck in a discrete control state forever, right? Whenever you enter a control state, eventually you leave it. So think of a heater, right? The heater will heat and eventually temperature will be high enough and there's an invariant that forces the heater. If the temperature goes too high, you have to leave and then you, you, you go into the off switch, right? So this is what I mean by liveness. Well, liveness is obviously undecidable in general because you can reduce reachability to liveness. It's very easy to manufacture this. But the question you can ask, you change the question a little bit and you can ask about structural liveness. So to explain what structural liveness is, first of all, let me tell you how is liveness enforced in a hybrid, in a, in a hybrid automaton. Well, you have this invariant set here. It's, I don't like the term invariant, but this is a term in literature. You have an invariant set, and what this means is that when you're in a state, the, the continuous variables have to be in this invariant set. This is going to be a polyhedron in general. You have to be in this invariant set. So for instance, for the heater, the invariant set is temperature is less than 22 and bigger than 70, or you know, something. And once you're about to leave this invariant set, leave this, the, the continuous behavior is taking you out of this polyhedron, this forces a discrete transition to happen. And this is how you enforce liveness. So what do we want to do? We want to make sure that wherever you are in this invariant set, the continuous evolution will always eventually lead you out of it. Right? So let me draw a, a picture. So just in words, this is the so-called polytope escape problem. So you're given you're given a polytope with this is to, to represent the continuous dynamics, and you say, you, you ask the, the, the contrapositive, you say, is there an initial point in the polytope such that the trajectory of the unique solution to the differential equation x dot is equal to f of x of t is entirely contained in, in i? So here's, let, let me just draw a picture. So here's your, here's your invariant set, and you're asking, suppose I start here, and I let the continuous behavior, the continuous dynamic, take its course. So maybe what happens is that you know you start tracing out, and ah, okay, eventually you escape this thing, and at the point of escape, this forces a discrete transition. So this is good. This ensures liveness. But suppose instead that from this point, you had this kind of let's say behavior that converged to this. This would be something that would fail liveness, obviously, because you know from there you actually you're not live anymore. You're going to be forever stuck in that uh, in that polyhedron, and therefore in that discrete state, right? Or you could rather. Right? So we want to look at structural liveness. Structural liveness means for every invariant set of at every discrete state, you always escape. Okay? So this is why I call structural liveness. You should think of structural liveness as a sort of compositional liveness. You check it for each state, and then it guarantees automatically that your system is live. And if it's not, then you should probably go back to the engineer and say, did you really mean that? Because here you've got an invariant from which you could get stuck, and probably this would be a bug. And so we um, had a result which was published at HSCC just a few weeks ago where this problem is decidable in all dimensions in polynomial space. And this might seem surprising to you because the problem of whether we actually reach a hyperplane, so think of a hyperplane here, just, just be one of those lines, that seems to be like super hard, right? You need channel, you need... Here we're saying, wait a minute, we want to know whether from every point we escape, not just a hyperplane, we escape this, you know, this thing which could be unbounded, but that actually turns out to be decidable. No chanual, no assumption, just, just straight out decidable. And therefore, structural liveness is decidable for linear hybrid automata. So basically, um, just tried to give you a cross-section of um, you know, some of the work we've done and also some of the kind of questions you can ask where you're shifting the, 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 um, the angle a little bit. And uh, to conclude, uh, this is my last slide, um, the, the, this research program uh, aims at looking at uh, solving, uh, well, studying and, and hopefully solving a range of central algorithmic problems that are coming from verification, from synthesis, from performance, from control. I mean, there, there are many other problems that um, I have not discussed here, but that we, we, we're looking at at the moment or that we, we've looked at. Uh, so many are new and emerging because mathematicians have just not asked these problems before. Uh, and some, of course, are open. I've been open for, for, for some time, um, but sometimes we can still make progress on those. And it's interesting, this, is, this talk has been entirely on a continuous system, but there's an analog where you can look at discrete dynamics. And um, uh, Javier was alluding to this earlier, where you have a, a linear transformation, and now you don't have a continuous behavior, but you've got a, a, a discrete dynamic where a linear transformation is applied every step. And a lot of the problems that 
you see in the continuous uh, world makes sense in the discrete world and vice versa. And you can draw inspiration from those. So we're also looking at uh, these. In fact, I've done a lot more work on the discrete side uh, uh, in the last few years. Um, and so the, the, and I guess the last thing I'd like to say is that ultimately what I'm trying to provide is a systematic computational treatment uh, of some of these fundamental models in mathematics, dynamical systems, uh, continuous dynamical systems, discrete dynamical systems, uh, cyber-physical systems, or hybrid automata, um, by looking at, I'm saying a fresh look at an old area. I mean, yes, these things have been studying for a long time, but we're asking slightly different questions, and we're going to try to solve them. Right. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Are there questions? Kim has one, I think, over there. But uh, if you have a question, please wait until the mic reaches you. Yeah, thank you very much for a very clear and, and interesting talk. Uh, so you said, ah, but my French friends, they always want to do approximation with this little... There's this tool called DReach, I think, from CMU, right? So is it, is it really... If you, if you allowed a little epsilon, is it trivial, or, or I'll be missing some open problems there? I mean, if you want to stay away with some epsilon distance for eternity, is that, is that clearly...? Uh, I, I think it depends on the question. So, for instance, here, here's one thing where the epsilon is not going to help you. I can give you a dynamical system with the following promise. Either it's diverging to infinity, or infinitely often it's, it has, it's, staying, uh, it's coming back to zero. Okay, and I promise you by construction, I can prove to you it does one of these two things. And I ask you, please decide. I want to know whether it diverges or whether it, it, it you know, infinitely often. And it's equivalent to these problems. So uh, it, this is a little bit like a fold in a rug, right? You can sometimes add an epsilon and solve it, but oftentimes you're just pushing the fold somewhere else. Okay. Yes, I see two different questions. I think you were first. Oh. Over there in the middle. Thanks, Joel. That was, that was great fun. Um, your, the, the, the zero problems, the bounded zero and the zero problems, I, I just wonder how uh, actually interesting they are for a cyber-physical system. So in the cruise control in my car, if it approaches the car in front but there's just tangentially zero distance, I don't really mind all that much. And maybe Bard's arrow just uh, doesn't, doesn't kill smog if it's tangentially zero. So is, is that... Uh, how, how bad is it? Yeah. How bad is it? Yes. I, I think it's a good, I mean, that's a very good question. I mean, I think, like I said, we're at the stage where we're trying to look at what, the, what are some of the fundamental questions in the sense of mathematically fundamental, you know, whether they really will be, you know, useful uh, in practice later on. I think some of the techniques might be useful, uh, certainly in the discrete case. Um, you know, we're looking a lot at termination of, of while loops. And people have been using ranking functions a lot for this, and very little has been... Um, uh, used by way of uh, spectral techniques, and we're using the spectral techniques a lot. So I think sometimes they can be combined. Whether the questions themselves remain relevant is also clear, but I'm pretty sure some of the techniques hopefully will, will be, uh, will, yeah, will come in handy. I think there was another one over there, yeah? Okay. Yeah, thanks for this is a really nice talk. Um, so, is there any intuition to the number eight? Like, why is it dimension eight and nine? Or is it just because it worked out? Like uh, it, it, well, I, it's because it worked out, but um, the, the <laughs> it requires some drawing. Um, it requires some drawing that are um, beyond my omnigraphal capabilities, basically. You have to, in order to explain how we can handle eight and not nine, right? I mean, the reason we can't handle nine is because we got this hardness, but how do we handle eight, right? People are a little bit, I mean, I've asked this question before, and um, there is some geometry that can be exploited where you can see why eight, but it's, it's, it's difficult to answer. I mean, it's not possible to answer like that, unfortunately. Okay, so it's, it has no relation to, to other subfields? It's not an immediate relation. It's, it's, okay. uh, it's, you look at the geometry and, and the, the, um, it comes out of, uh, you know, when, when you sort of corner the problem and massage it in a particular way, yeah, I you, see, I see. it comes out. Basically. Another one? Hi, Joel. Um, so, uh, does, do these results now imply something for the discrete case as well? Like for the scholar and so on? Do you? 
No, they don't. Um, that's the interesting thing. Often they inform the intuition. You have a result here, and then it gives you an idea how to attack or, you know, but it doesn't really know because uh, fundamentally what happens is with this column problem, your exponential polynomial is these eigenvalues being raised to the power, and here it's e being raised to the eigenvalue times t, and so it's, it's different uh, somehow. Uh, so, so I don't think it does, at least I haven't, I haven't not, not directly. So I guess we could take one last question if there is one. I think everybody's happy. So then I would like you to make some nice noise with your hands while I hand to Joel this little token of appreciation. Wow. Thank you. Thanks very much, Javier. Was this, was this yours? Or, yeah, thank you. Right.